Okay, so uh, I'd like to start with just a personal note. I remember about 20 years ago, I met um, this bright young mathematician and I had a sense that she was a rising star and it has turned out to be correct. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Lorsen Raymond for the, it's the SIAM PD uh, seminar. Um, she is currently a professor at Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon and fellow of the Institut Universitaire de France and previously at the Université de Paris 6. Her main contributions concern the transition between atomistic and continuous models for gas dynamics through rigorous mathematical analysis. She has obtained major results concerning the asymptotic theory of the Boltzmann equation in kinetic theory of gases. She has also studied problems of scale separation in the context of geophysical flows, especially for wind-driven ocean oceanic dynamics. She has been awarded a lot of prizes, including the SIAG APDE prize in 2006, uh, pri the prize of the European Mathematical Society, the Ruth Satter Prize of the AMS, the Fermat Prize, and the Boucher Memorial Prize. And she is a member of the French Academy of Sciences, the Academia Europea, and, Europe and the European Academy, Academy of Sciences. I don't know how you keep all those straight, Law, but anyway, it's a pleasure to introduce you. And she's speaking today on fluctuation theory in the Boltzmann grad limit. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. So first of all, I would like to apologize for the, the big bazaar uh, last week. I'm really sorry that uh, it didn't work. Um, um, so what I would like to tell you about is a, a big project, a big ongoing project actually with uh, Thierry Bodino, Isabel Gallagher and Sergio Simonera about this uh, Boltzmann grad limit. So uh, in the introduction, um, Walter mentioned that uh, I was interested in this uh, connection between, uh, uh, say, atomistic level of description and fluid mechanics. And in between, there is this uh, kinetic theory and Boltzmann equation. And so what I would like to discuss today is the first um, step between atomistic description and kinetic description. Okay, so uh, um, our um, starting point today will be um, the dynamics of a very, very uh, simplified model of gas, which is uh, uh, art sphere gas. So meaning that uh, at the microscopic level, you just assume that you have a, a collection, a very a big system of uh, small particles, which are uh, billiard balls, so of radius uh, epsilon. And uh, so the number of these uh, balls is typically a capital N. And the dynamics of these balls is really uh, simple. So they just um, move with uh, uh, rectilinear motion, uh, uh, uniform rectilinear motion. And uh, until they collide, okay? And then uh, the only thing that you have to prescribe is a boundary condition, which is what happens when two uh, balls collide. And here, what we will assume is that you have uh, elastic collision. So a collision which will preserve both the momentum. So uh, the, the, after the collision, uh, the velocity, the sum of the velocity will be uh, equal to the sum of the velocity before the collision. And uh, also it preserves uh, energy, okay? So for this uh, very simple geometry, actually, this, is, um, uh, this system is uh, very uh, well defined in, in the sense that uh, essentially you have only one possible uh, reflection if you uh, uh, assume both the conservation of momentum, the non-penetration con condition, and the, um, the conservation of energy, okay? So now, of course, this is a very complex system if the number of particles is, uh, is uh, very large. And so what we are interested in is to understand the statistical description of this uh, system, okay? So um, I, I will try to explain a little bit uh, better what I mean by uh, statistical description. So uh, of course, if you prescribe your, uh, your initial state, of course, with these dynamics, 
say, up to a, a zero measure set of initial data for which the dynamics is not well defined, then uh, the, the, the dynamics is deterministic and you know the, the configuration of the gas forever. Okay, so the, the, the system itself is deterministic, but what, uh, say, the random variable somehow is the, 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 the initial configuration. Okay, so uh, uh, you have actually two uh, very um, standard settings to, um, to look at this uh, 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 statistical problem. So either you prescribe the number of particles and then you assume that what is random is the distribution of this particle at time zero. And this is what is called a canonical setting. And then you have, say, uh, the counterpart of uh, the, the, the system of ODEs for the particles is this transport equation. I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but so you have this, this equation here, which is called the Liouville equation, which just tells you that it's exactly the same as uh, uh, I, I was uh, telling about uh, the microscopic dynamics. So you see that the particle number i as its position xi, which will um, be transported by this velocity vi, okay? And this is essentially the only uh, mechanism, uh, which is uh, the transport. And the collision actually is prescribed in the domain of this transport equation, which tells you that you have exclusion between the different uh, particles. And then uh, the collision is just a boundary condition on this, uh, for this transport equation. Okay, so this is the canonical setting. And then there is, say, another level of, of uh, randomness, which is to prescribe uh, uh, the number of particles according to a Poisson process, essentially. Okay, so uh, the grand canonical setting is almost the same. So once you know the number of particles, you have this UV equation and, and uh, this transport, uh, uh, say, when the, the number of particles is fixed. But say, at the initial uh, time, you don't fix this number of, of um, particles, you uh, give a distribution where you see that you have uh, this parameter mu epsilon, which will be the typical number of particles, and you have a Poisson law for this uh, F naught is the typical distribution of one particle. So you have almost a product here, a tensor product. Then of course you have to prescribe the, the exclusion condition. So at time zero, uh, the particles cannot overlap. And then you have this, which is the Poisson distribution for the number of particles. And then you normalize the rules in. Okay, so this, so this problem is really a, a problem where the dynamics itself is deterministic, but you have a, a, a statistical setting in the sense that you have a distribution, a probabilistic distribution on the initial configuration. Okay, and so now, um, we will not look at this system in full generality. We will just focus on one specific scaling. And this specific scaling is the one where you expect, say, typically uh, the particle to, um, to have one collision per unit of time. Okay, so essentially this is the regime that you are interested in. So that's essentially uh, the two mechanisms. So transport on the one end and collision on the other end are in some sense uh, balanced, well balanced. Okay, so. Uh, this this uh, very uh, rough computation is actually goes back to uh, Maxwell. So it, it tells you, um, uh, say, the scaling condition between the no typical number of particles, which is mu epsilon, and their diameter, which is epsilon. Okay, and so uh, what is called the Boltzmann grass scaling is when you have that this product mu epsilon times epsilon to the d minus one is of the order of one, and this this quantity here is just the inverse mean free pass of, uh, so the typical distance, which is uh, uh, that particle uh, moves on between two collisions. Okay, so this, this is uh, uh, really uh, um, just a, a competition of order of magnitude. Okay, so, but this is the scaling that we will be interested on. And so this is really important because for instance, if then you think about uh, fluid models, so which is not, what I will describe today, but it's uh, still important. You see that uh, because of this, uh, this uh, very strong assumption on the scaling, you will not be able to describe any possible fluid, but only perfect gases in the sense that if you look at the, uh, the typical, the, the volume which is occupied by the particles, which is mu epsilon times epsilon to the D, each particle has a volume uh, which is like epsilon, epsilon to the D, you see that this quantity goes to zero. So you have no excluded volume and you cannot so for instance, it's impossible to have uh, a fluid which will be uh, both uh, compressible and viscous, 
Okay, so you have uh, very uh, strong, um, uh, say, strong consequences of this, this scaling assumption. Okay, this is, was just a, a sad remark, but uh, I think it's important. Okay, so now what are the questions? So the, the first question is actually a question that has been answered by uh, Lanford, um, I think some, something like 40 years ago. And uh, uh, the question is, what is the almost sure dynamics of the system when the number of particles goes to infinity? Okay, so say for in a more probabilistic language, this is what is the law of large numbers for this system? Okay, so this is the, the very first question, of course. Say, what uh, will you observe typically? What is the typical behavior? Then there is a second question, which is a little bit more advanced, uh, which is the counterpart of central limit CRM. Is, is it possible to describe the fluctuation around this, this uh, average behavior? Okay, so this, this is, say, somehow the, the next question. So the kind of fluctuation around this, this uh, typical behavior. And then a third question, maybe, which is uh, still uh, 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 more difficult somehow, somehow to, to catch, which is the probability of observing uh, dynamics which are completely different. Okay, so this is also called uh, rare events or large deviations. Okay, so all, all this question, if you are able to answer all these questions somehow, you end up with a very um, uh, complete picture, a very global picture of the statistical behavior of this uh, gas. Okay, so all these questions are very classical in the framework of, of uh, system at equilibrium. But here, say somehow what is different is that we would, we would like to do the same for the dynamical system. Okay, so not only uh, this, uh, this, uh, all these questions at equilibrium, but also uh, all these questions when, when you have a dynamic. Okay, so uh, essentially what I will try to do today is uh, first of all to um, recall or, or, or give an overview of uh, the answer to question one and also of the say the missing information about question one okay so this this is somehow uh, uh, the work uh, going back to Lanford and then I will try to uh, tell you uh, how the new uh, ingredient that uh, we have um, we have been able to, to design say uh, uh, allow to 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 answer the uh, two other questions, at least for a short time. Okay, so what I would like to uh, explain is how we can uh, answer question two and three uh, with this uh, this uh, this uh, new method. Okay, so let me first um, uh, start with uh, this uh, this uh, more classical thing about the Lanford theorem. So um, I have here a very uh, rough statement of this theorem. Of course, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, we can discuss this statement a little bit uh, after. So the, the, the statement is as follows. So if you look at the Boltzmann grad scaling, so meaning that you have this relation between uh, uh, the number of particles mu epsilon and the size of the particle epsilon, and you uh, look at the limits when uh, mu epsilon tends to infinity, then the empirical measure, so the empirical measure is just this, 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 uh, it's just one over mu epsilon times the, the, the sum of the direct mass at each point. So here it's a little bit more complicated because you have this, this, um, this, uh, um, this ground canonical setting. So it's not one over n, but one over mu epsilon. The, the, say, um, the normalization is just a little bit different. So this guy actually concentrates, so uh, it will converge to the solution of the Boltzmann equation. So now the Boltzmann equation, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know it at all, it's a, a kinetic equation. So it's an equation in the space. So the phase space here is uh, uh, the function f depends on, on time, of course, on the one position x and one velocity v. And so it tells you it, uh, how uh, particles are distributed according to their position and their velocity. Okay, and then Essentially, you have two um, parts in this equation. So the, the, the left hand side is just the transport. So it's, of course, uh, the uh, coming from transport at the microscopic level. And then you have here the right hand side, which is a collision term. So you can see that it's uh, the formula is a little bit complicated, but actually, it's not very complicated to have an intuition of it. So it tells you that say the number of particles with velocity v can be uh, increased if you have two particles of velocity v prime and v prime star 
which uh, undergo a collision and then uh, one uh, of the outgoing particle has velocity v so this is one um, this is the way you can increase f and there is a way you can decrease f which is just this uh, last term here if you have one particle of velocity v which collides with another particle of velocity v star and then they uh, they jump to other velocities then you will have less particle of velocity v okay and then, uh, so uh, this this uh, this uh, collision process is ruled by uh, uh, statistics here, which is uh, so here. This is the, the case of hard spheres. Here you have this um, this uh, collision cross section, which tells you what is the probability of this jump process. Okay, so this is uh, an equation which is uh, uh, I'll say a complicated mathematical object. Uh, say just. Uh, uh, proving the existence of solution for uh, for uh, uh, globally in time is a very uh, complicated story. You need to renormalize the equation and so on, and uh, understanding as well the, uh, the the behavior as time goes to infinity is also a complicated uh, thing. But so essentially, what you expect is that you this ex this equation predicts the uh, relaxation towards global equilibrium. Okay, so all these things are formally not very complicated, but say if you would like to writes mathematical statements it's another story okay so here this is partly the reason why uh, this convergence result holds only for short time okay because else if you would like to have uh, more global time then uh, you need to understand uh, uh, much better the equation the limiting equation and it's a complicated story okay so if you see this statement then uh, you can ask two questions there are two very natural questions the first one is uh, the one that I, I would like to discuss uh, maybe a little bit more in the, in the sequel here, is that uh, if you look at the Boltzmann equation, as I told you, it predicts some relaxation towards equilibrium. So this means that the dynamics is somehow irreversible. You start from a, an initial data, which can be uh, whatever you want. Okay, you need to prescribe some uh, decay condition at infinity and so on, but okay, essentially you can uh, start with any distribution that uh, you would like to uh, choose. And then in the limit, you see that essentially there is just one state, which is an equilibrium, and that you will converge <coughs> in a, some strong sense to this equilibrium. And so of course you cannot go back. Okay, so this is another way to see that, or to, to, to state this property, is to say that you have an H, an H theorem for the Boltzmann equation. So you have a Lyapunov function, uh, which is the entropy or the, uh, the opposite of the entropy depends on the convention. But so this quantity uh, is, uh, is uh, so if this is the entropy, it's a, a, a quantity which is increased with time, okay? And so you see that somehow it's just impossible to go back. While if you think about the, the microscopic system, of course, this is a completely reversible uh, system. It's an Hamiltonian system. And so there is no objection to go back and uh, uh, forward and backward. Okay, so this is really an important problem. And actually this problem was, uh, say from the historical point of view, it has been really, really uh, uh, probably the main obstacle uh, for the, um, say, uh, in order that uh, this, this equation, which was uh, proposed by Boltzmann, was really uh, recognized by the, by the mm -hmm. community. Okay, so I think it's really uh, an important point. And it's also uh, still an important uh, question, say from the philosophical point of view, and so there are there are really many people working on this, but here what I would propose is a much um, okay, much more basic it will be just an explanation from the mathematical point of view of this uh, uh, the origin of this uh, irreversibility. Okay, so this is one point which say um, which is uh, which has to be um, uh, studied, and the other point, of course, is the this restriction for short time. So as I mentioned, uh, the one of the problem is that the Boltzmann equation is not very uh, is not a very uh, uh, sympathetic equation, and so uh, uh, we need to have a, a, a good theory for this equation if we would like to have a more global convergence results. And and but okay, th this is another point that uh, we hope to be able to um, to study uh, with uh, our methods, uh, but of course this is why the project is still ongoing and probably it's still uh, uh, for the far future. 
Okay, so uh, let me just mention uh, a little bit how uh, the, the proof works for this uh, um, um, Lanford theorem. So the idea is to uh, look at the, what is called the correlation function, which are defined here. So the correlation function of uh, order n is this function f n epsilon. Uh, so if you uh, uh, work in the canonical setting, it's, it's easy because this is just a marginal of the distribution function of order n, okay? But if you look uh, at the grand canonical setting, then uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Actually, it's defined by duality. So you just look at uh, the, the, this function tested on some, say, test function hn, and uh, it gives you the expectation of uh, all possible combination of this hn on all possible uh, configuration. Okay, so you pick at random, and particles in your system, compute this Hn, and then uh, uh, average both on all possible uh, n-uplets and on uh, all possible initial configuration. Okay, so that's, that's what this uh, correlation function is. And now if you start from the Liouville equation and just uh, uh, write the Liouville equation for all um, W, and then you end up with this equation, which has some similarities with the Boltzmann equation because you see that you have two parts, one part which is the, right, the left hand side, which tells you that you have transport, and the right hand side here, which tells you that you have uh, collisions, so collision between the particles uh, between one and n, which are already a particle that you somehow you track in the system, and another particle, which is labeled here n plus one, which uh, somehow describe the boundary of, of your, um, of your um, uh, domain. So if you think of your uh, 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 small n particles, you see that uh, they can move in a domain, which is limited by the fact that you have other particles. And so this, this uh, uh, term here comes from this boundary condition, okay? So uh, really, you, uh, I will discuss a little bit the difference between this collision operator here and, and the collision operator arriving in the, the Boltzmann equation. But you see that essentially you have the same structure, transport and collision. But then you see that there is one major difference between this system here and the Boltzmann equation. The Boltzmann equation is closed, okay? It tells you that you have a closed equation on the first uh, correlation function. Well, here you see that in order to write the, um, the dynamics of the n correlation function, you need uh, to know uh, the correlation function of order n plus one. Okay, so this, this is not closed. You, you need, um, and so if you would like to write the solution of this big, big system, which is actually an infinite system, then uh, actually you need to iterate the DuAML uh, formula and you end up with this complicated thing so that uh, f epsilon n at time t will be the sum of many different possible scenarios, which tells you, so this operator here tells you that you have transport of your n particle, then a collision, which add a new particle, then transport of your n plus one particle, then uh, uh, another collision, and etc. until time zero, and you assume that at time zero, you have m additional particles. Okay, and this number m can go from zero to infinity. Okay, so somehow when you write this solution with these complicated operators, what you are doing is to uh, just uh, list uh, all possible scenarios for your particle. Okay, you, you, you start with n particles and you say, I ju I, you just uh, uh, go back and try to see all the possible scenarios for these particles. Okay, so now you see that uh, there is a very natural way to represent these this, uh, different scenarios with, um, with collision trees. So here, for instance, I, I'm just looking at the first uh, correlation function. So I start with one particle at time t, and then I, I, I'm, I'm trying to track back the history of this particle. So I go back in time. So I know that I have transport here up uh, to the time t1, where I will have a collision with another particle, which I call particle two or particle one uh, without star. I think the notation here is that one star is the particle existing from the beginning. And, and then I add particle one, and then I add particle two at time t2, and then particle three at time t3. And what I say is that somehow I will have a combination of all possible scenarios like this. So meaning that I have to sum over all possible number of branching in the my collision tree. 
over all possible time of collision, all possible uh, um, velocity of the new particle here, and all, all possible uh, angle uh, at the collision time. Okay, so this is what is uh, written here. And I can uh, describe this, this kind of dynamical object, which are not the real dynamics, but what we call pseudodynamics. So this is, this is the way I, I um, map this particle one to an initial configuration here. So how I obtain my initial configuration, starting from this particle one star here, and adding particles according to my uh, collision tree. Okay, so this tree with n roots and m branchings. And for each branching, I have to prescribe, you see that I have to prescribe um, uh, this new, uh, this, uh, this uh, angle here, omega i, and I uh, have to prescribe the velocity vi. And possibly I have a scattering if, if this is a, a post collisional um, uh, Okay, so this is what is written here. So I, this is just a ref reformulation of the previous formula, which tells you that uh, essentially you can um, write your um, n particle correlation function as a sum over all possible m over all possible uh, branching uh, trees, uh, collision trees, uh, and uh, the integral over all possible uh, collision parameters of a quantity which just uh, tell you something about this uh, collision cross-section. And uh, here, the initial data uh, on this uh, initial configuration that I have uh, constructed this way. Okay, so this is the geometric representation. And I, I uh, spend a little bit of time on this uh, geometric representation because it will be really uh, the key ingredient when you uh, would like to understand the correlation. Okay, so here this is the the uh, step zero understanding uh, the geometric representation of uh, say just um, uh, this uh, this uh, correlation function. Okay, so now uh, uh, the once you have this this uh, uh, good representation of 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 your um, uh, so this this is what is called the BBGKY hierarchy. Then the Landford proof is uh, relatively straightforward. Essentially, you have two steps. So the first step is to obtain a, 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 an a priori estimate. You see that uh, you have a, a big, big series here because you see that this parameter m is, is unbounded and then you have to uh, sum over all possible trees with m branching. So you see that the combinatorics of this guy is, uh, is kind of dangerous, okay? And so you need to have uh, um, an a priori estimate to say that uh, this, is, this formula is meaningful, okay? And so here, this is a very uh, simple way of counting all these uh, things. So if you start with uh, n points and you would like to uh, count the number of possible trees, you see that for the first branching, you have n choices. For the second branching, you have n plus one choices. And for the uh, branching number m, you have n plus m minus one branching. Okay, so the, the combinatorics of this, this set is this uh, big guy here. But now you see that if you are, uh, if you just consider this this uh, formula for short time, you see that uh, for this branching, you have a kind of simplex in time. Sorry, uh, because because of course you assume that the first collision is before the second one, before the third one, and so when you integrate with respect to this simplex in time, what you get is something like t to the n divided by factorial n. Okay. So now um, now you see that uh, you can say uh, you have a bound, a simple bound on this, uh, on this guy here, and you get uh, uh, that uh, essentially it's bounded by t to the m times two to the m or something like this. So this factor is not really um, harmful. And so essentially you have something like t to the m. And so you see that for short time, uh, the series will be convergent. Okay, so th this is say, from the technical point of view, this is why you have this restriction on the short time, okay? But uh, actually, there are many uh, works now to try to, to r remove this, uh, this, this assumption. But for the moment, we are able to do this in linear setting, but not in, uh, in uh, the fully nonlinear setting. OK. And now the second step in, the, in, the, in this uh, proof of uh, Lanford is to compare this uh, uh, representation with the representation of uh, the solution to the Boltzmann equation. OK, so you can exactly. Uh, uh, proceed the same way and have a representation of the Boltzmann solution with collision trees, okay? And now, and with uh, these uh, pseudo trajectories, and now we just 
so focus on the difference. So essentially, the, 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 there are two different. Uh, the first difference is that when you add a new particle in the Boltzmann uh, uh, dynamics, you have no uh, shift. You add the particle exactly at the same position. Okay, but this this will, this is not very uh, not really a, an issue. Okay, so I can just forget about this. And you have the other uh, main difference is that say in the Boltzmann equation, once you have two particles in your uh, system, they will not see each other. Okay, they will just cross each other and they they will not see each other uh, at any time. Okay, so they could. Uh, at some point, you have a new particle which is created in the in the tree, but then uh, it can co it can uh, cross with any other particle without having really a collision. Okay, so this is really what is different between the Boltzmann uh, uh, dynamics and uh, the real dynamics is that the Boltzmann dynamics will not see all this what we call recollision. Okay, so if uh, this particle two and three, which are already in the system, uh, collide uh, for real. Uh, then uh, you see that you have some scattering and then uh, you cannot compare the two trajectories. But if, uh, so essentially what you have to do is to control the set of parameters, of collision parameters for which you can have such a recollision. Okay, and so uh, essentially the proof is a geometric proof where you say, okay, now we have to control the sets of uh, parameters here for this collision and this collision for which I will have a recollision. And we can prove that this set is a very uh, small measure, so it will essentially not contribute to the to the average. Okay, so really you have this uh, these three important ingredients in Nanford proof. So first ingredient is this geometric representation with these collision trees. Second ingredient is this a priori estimate, which tells you that for short time uh, this this uh, uh, series ex expansion is meaningful. And third ingredient is this geometric analysis of recollision, which tells you that actually the, the recollision are kind of pathological and they will not really contribute to the um, to uh, the dynamics. Okay, so this is our starting point now. But now the question is, uh, say, if we uh, refine this analysis, is it possible to say something about these correlations? Okay, and to understand uh, much better why we have this irreversibility and so on. Okay, and is it possible actually to retrieve uh, reversibility if we describe the, the, the correlation? Okay, so, um, um, so here, the, the, instead of looking at uh, this, um, this, um, this uh, correlation function, which say somehow, so the result is that actually that any correlation function of any order we, will converge to a, a tensor product, okay, because Say what we prove in in uh, with this uh, with Ladford strategy is that actually in the limit uh, all this correlation all this recollision uh, will uh, not contribute and so essentially what you expect is if that if you start with a gas where all the particles are more or less independent then they will uh, remain independent and so you still have chaos and say the n particle correlation function will just look like uh, uh, the solution to the Boltzmann equation uh, to the power n. Okay, so this this is the, the, the complete result for Lanford. But now I would like to understand much better this correlation. So this means that I would like to understand the correction. So I can say that, for instance, the, the second correlation function is well approximated by the, 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 the product of, uh, uh, the tensor product of the first correlation function. But now I would like to understand the, the correction, okay? So now there is a quantity, which uh, I actually, uh, I have to say that uh, at the very beginning of this project, uh, I would have never bet that uh, we can say something about this exponential moment, but uh, actually we can. So, so now instead of looking at, at polynomial moment, what I will uh, try to do is to look at this exponential moment. So you, you see that I take the expectation of something which is not a sum of, of function uh, depending on two or three or four uh, or uh, 25 variables, but really the exponential of this sum, okay, which is much more complicated, of course, and which uh, gives you a uh, much more precise information. And then I take the logarithm of this guy and then uh, divide by mu epsilon because you, you see that if all this quantity were independent, then the exponential would be uh, just a project, product of independent uh, things. So you can uh, take the expectation, it would be just a sum. Okay, and then you expect this quantity to uh, to to scale like one over one, like mu epsilon. Okay, so this 
if you start with independent variable, then you expect this quantity to be a good, good quantity. Okay. And now it's uh, well known that, uh, say, for instance, in the, the case of uh, equilibrium situation, we know that uh, this, th there is a, a very, um, um, say, as long as you don't have any uh, phase transition and so on, what you expect is that uh, this quantity actually is a, 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 a function which is analytic. Okay. And so you can uh, decompose. So look at this, this uh, the series expansion of this uh, function here. And uh, the coefficient that uh, arise here are called the cumulants. Okay, so cumulants read, uh, give you an information which is not said. The good thing with the cumulant is that, for instance, if you look at the cumulant of order two, it really uh, tells you something on on the, the on the covariance, for instance. Okay, so it say somehow it removes the, the the information which is already encoded on on the first. Uh, correlation function and just tells you what what is missing in this in this uh, first correlation function if you would like to understand the joint probability of two things okay and so this is the same for the the, the this uh, cumulant of order n will encode an information which is neither in the first nor in the, the second nor in the n minus one cumulant so really you have this this notion of being somehow orthogonal to each other okay so this is really additional information each time. Okay, so now what we would like to do is to uh, understand the geometric representation of these cumulants, exactly as, so we add this, this uh, geometric representation of, uh, so the starting point is the, the geometric representation of the n particle correlation function. So here we have a, a graph. So an example where when uh, n is equal to five. So uh, I start with this, uh, this dynamics and I say that, okay, now I uh, let uh, the system evolve and I write uh, the, uh, my, my BBGKY hierarchy, and I know that I can start from all these, these five points and then go back. And so I have a combination of transport and collision. So collision is when I add a new particle, okay? But you know, there, there is also something else, which I, I have called already a uh, recollision, which is when you have two particles which are already in the system, which have a collision, okay? So now if you think uh, really at, uh, at the level of intuition, you see that say the reason why all this say, this particle number one uh, star, particle number two star and particle number three star are not independent from each other is exactly because you have this kind of free collision. Okay, if, if I, I had say separate trees, then I can write like a sort of product and then I'm very happy because I can say that, so, okay, I have exactly some chaos and then uh, I just need the first correlation function and then I, I'm, I'm, I'm finished, okay? So now it's, it's not the case because of course, these particles are not independent because you can have this free collision, okay? So now you, you will group all these trees. So each particle is attached with uh, its uh, tree, its dynamical tree. But now we will group these trees in, into forests and the forest is a, a group of, of, uh, of uh, collision trees which are coupled, okay, which, will, uh, which are connected by some recollision, okay? So now you see that I have here, I have two forests, this one and this one, okay? But now you see that uh, it's not uh, uh, true that forests are really independent of each other because exactly because of the definition that if you are in two different forests, then you have no recollision. And having no recollision is not being independent. It's one minus having a recollision. Okay, so this means that actually, if, if I, I keep only this, this, this uh, forest, then I still have some correlation between these two forests, which is the, the usual uh, uh, exclusion uh, uh, correlation. If you say that uh, two, uh, two things are, are far from each other, then it's one, which is being independent, minus uh, being close to each other. Okay, so this is the, the, the second step here, the second geometric step where you uh, just expand uh, this, uh, the fact that uh, uh, you have to be uh, far from each other. So this is the cumulative expansion of the exclusion. Now exclusion is not a, stat a static exclusion, but it's really a, a, the, 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 the exclusion of the trees. Okay. And so you just use the, 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 the usual expansion of this, uh, this, uh, this exclusion. And now you can group forests into jungles. Okay. So these jungles, uh, two forests are in the same jungles. If uh, you see that, that now it's not a dynamical, uh, really a dynamical 
uh, correlation. So recollision are really dynamical correlation. Now overlap is just the way you expand your uh, your uh, your series, saying that uh, I don't want to say that uh, two objects are far from each other. I prefer to say that they, they are independent minus uh, they are uh, close to each other. Okay, so overlap is just being close to each other, but you see that you don't have any uh, dynamical correlation between these guys. You just say that at some point they, they should overlap each other, but this will not change the dynamics inside the, 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 the uh, inside the journal. Okay, and then uh, you have a, a last actually source of uh, correlation which comes from the initial data because of course the initial data at, at initial time you cannot have overlap, and so this is uh, the the thing which is uh, the correlation which is represented by the yellow uh, circle here on the on the on the picture. Okay, so. Uh, uh, at this point, what you can say is that somehow you have the, the, the geometric representation of, of your um, uh, correlation function, but now you also have the, the geometric representation of your, um, of your uh, cumulant. So being a cumulant, meaning that you are uh, completely connected, okay? So the cumulant of order n will correspond to all this, uh, to, to the, the, the sub part of all these uh, possible dynamics such that in the end, so the big uh, yellow thing is uh, everybody. Okay, so the cumulant of order n, if, if we are, have uh, just expanded the, the, the correlation function of order n, then the, the cumulant of order n is the information which is not encoded in the previous uh, cumulants. And so it means that really everybody is connected and you can be connected by three different ways. So either by a recollision or by an overlap or by uh, the initial uh, data, okay? And then uh, you try to do exactly the same as for the, uh, the Landford proof. So the second step is to obtain a short time estimate. So of course, uh, there is a little bit of uh, technical work to, to do all of this, but I will just uh, tell you, uh, say, um, heuristically uh, what you obtain. So um, what I told you is that this cumulant corresponds to a connected graphs of size n. So this is uh, the, the, the formula to write this. And so uh, now this means that you can identify n minus one independent clustering constraints. So either uh, because you have a recollision in, inside, the forest, in, uh, yeah, inside the forest, or because you have an overlap, or because you are connected at time zero. And if you integrate all these this, this constraints, you see that each time you, you uh, have a constraint, essentially you, you gain a factor one over mu epsilon. Okay, and now I have this scaling factor that I, uh, um, I decided to, uh, that I ch chose from the beginning. Okay, so I decided that my, my um, uh, cumulant will be rescaled. So I, I have rescaled in order to end up with something which is of the order of one. Okay, and so I end up with uh, this estimate that the L1 norm of, of the cumulant of order N is uh, typically, typically of the order of factor N, which, is, which in some sense, measure all the possible way of doing the, the connection. Okay, this is just the combinatorics. And then you have this T to the N minus one, which comes from the clustering constraint. Of course, if you, uh, you would like to have the clustering on the, on the time interval zero T, this is uh, much more complicated to have than having the same clustering on a, a bigger time. Okay, and so the, 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 the very uh, nice thing with this is that if you come back to uh, the expression of the exponential moment in terms of the, the cumulant, and you see that for short time, you have a, a, a series expansion, which is absolutely converging, okay? So now this means that uh, uh, you really have this, um, the, this, uh, this um, uniform control on, on the cumulant and on the exponential moment, but uh, you have the control, the uniform control, but you, you have also the convergence, okay? Because uh, actually exactly as we were able to remove, say, all this uh, uh, recollision uh, in the case when I, I just look at the first uh, correlation function, now what I will be able to remove is all the recollision which are non-clustering. Okay, so of course I need some recollision to have a connected graph, but then I can have another uh, recollision here. This one will not uh, count. Okay, so it will be a correction at the scale of the cumulant. So this one, of course, is small because, uh, and this is the reason why the cumulant is small, but this one is, even smaller, and it will not uh, contribute uh, to the main part of the cumulant. Okay, so typically the, 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 the main part of the cumulant correspond to uh, the graphs. Okay, if you, uh, if I, I um, 
we discuss this problem in terms of graphs. You see that the cumulant of order n correspond to uh, connected graphs. Uh, on a, on a, so you have the, 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 the n uh, vertices, uh, the n vertices, which are the, the n particles uh, uh, at time t, and which are associated to their collision trees. Then you have uh, uh, the cumulant of order n is the case where all these vertices are connected. So you have a, a connected graph. And now the main part of this cumulant is correspond to the case where you have a minimally connected graph. So exactly uh, uh, n minus one uh, correlations. Okay, so this is really important because all the other, and once you have, once you have characterized your, uh, say the main part of your, um, of your, uh, uh, of your um, uh, cumulant, then you can actually take limits in this, in this uh, cumulant, okay? And so it's, it will be really important because uh, actually this means that you are able to encode information at any scale, okay? Because I, I recall you that say, just to be, um, to be, try to be, uh, uh, as clear as possible. So the cumulants uh, uh, somehow measure the correlation between the particles. And what I say that the, 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 the correlation of order n is something which is really, really small because it's supported on a, on, a, on, a, on a very small part of the phase space, the size of which is like mu epsilon to the minus n minus one. Okay, so it's not, it's not of course, because of, of my, my uh, normalization, it will not be small in L1 norm, it will be of the order of one. But if you look at the support, the support is really, really small. So this means that with this process, we are able to extract um, uh, information which are supported by, by sets which are smaller and smaller, okay, at any scale. It's really important that we are able to uh, extract this information at any scale. Okay, so now uh, I, I would just uh, take maybe uh, five minutes, if I have still five minutes, just to explain uh, uh, why this, this convergence is important and how it allows to answer to question uh, uh, two and three. Okay, so um, uh, the answer of, uh, to question two is written here. This is this uh, theorem one, which tells you that if you look at the Boltzmann graph limit, so mu epsilon tends to infinity, and if you look at the fluctuation field, so you take your empirical measure and you subtract uh, the average, Okay, so the, the first uh, correlation function, and you rescale by mu epsilon, which is the, 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 uh, the scaling of uh, the central limit theorem, then you can look at this object and, and look at the convergence of this object, and you can prove that in low it converges, so still for a short time, to the solution of the fluctuating Boltzmann equation. So this means here, so it's a little bit complicated here, but you can see that the fluctuation uh, will uh, be uh, governed by this equation where you have one term here, which is the linearized part of the Boltzmann equation. So you have transport and the linearized part of the collision pattern here. And here you have a, a, a Gaussian noise. And uh, of course you can characterize completely the covariance of this noise. Okay, and you have, if you are at equilibrium, then uh, you have the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which tells you that actually uh, the, the, the fluctuation uh, here co corresponding to this noise exactly corresponds to the dissipation uh, but out of equilibrium, this, this theorem is still valid and you still have this uh, fluctuating Boltzmann equation, okay? And so it's a simple consequence of this, um, of this uh, conversion of the exponential moment because you can just use the characteristic function to uh, prove that uh, the limiting process will be a Gaussian process, okay? So this, this, this is, so uh, there is a little bit of work, but essentially you can just uh, use this and then you, you just need to, uh, uh, to characterize the covariance. And it's not say, once again, it's, it just comes from uh, the convergence of this characteristic function. Okay, so really this is a very uh, powerful tool. Uh, maybe as uh, uh, two powerful tools. So maybe uh, in this case of um, just small fluctuation, maybe it's not uh, really uh, uh, necessary to, to look at this exponential moment, but in any case, it will, it gives you a, a very, um, very uh, simple answer to the question, okay? And then uh, there is the question of uh, large deviation. And actually this exponential moment is uh, once again, the, the right tool to, uh, to answer this question. And uh, so what you can prove is that the empirical measure will satisfy a uh, large deviation estimates, not really a large deviation uh, principle because we have not so, we have some restriction on, uh, on, the, on the, but essentially what you say is that uh, uh, you can measure 
Um, so it's essentially uh, uh, the fact that observing a, a dynamics which is different uh, from, uh, from uh, the Boltzmann uh, dynamics is something which is exponentially small, so of the order of exponential of minus mu epsilon times the quantity, and this quantity is given by this functional, which is called the large deviation functional, and um, uh, which is uh, this functional here. So here you can recognize uh, this part here, which is the entropy, so the, the relative entropy at time zero. And then you have uh, two parts, so you have like a, a, a an optimization problem. And here, this Hamiltonian, so here you see that you have the, 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 the conjugate of this Hamiltonian, the function uh, which is conjugate to this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian is, uh, has been already predicted by Reza Kanlu and, and uh, by Philippe Boucher. And it's uh, very uh, similar to the Boltzmann. Uh, uh, equation. So you he you see here that phi is the phi is somehow the, the dynamics that you would like to see, okay. And uh, p uh, is more or less the, the uh, somehow uh, the, the 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 dual variable. And so you have this Hamiltonian here, okay. And so uh, uh, maybe uh, the last thing that I would like to uh, to say is that actually we have a very um, a nice. Uh, characterization of this functional. Actually, the way we obtain this functional is not uh, a direct way, but uh, it's just uh, by uh, taking the limit in this uh, exponential moment and proving that that uh, this uh, this uh, um, uh, current uh, generating uh, function satisfies this hamilton jacobi equation, which is written here. And the, the very uh, uh, good thing with this equation is that, okay, so if you look at uh, the minimizer of this, uh, this uh, i, of course, you find the Boltzmann, the solution of the Boltzmann equation, but this equation is reversible. Okay, so this means that, say, looking at all these cumulants, somehow you have retrieved the information which was missing uh, to be able to go back in the Boltzmann dynamics. Okay, so uh, I, I know it's very uh, uh, rapid, and uh, this equation is very, it's, uh, okay, the, the Boltzmann equation is like a mess, but this one is uh, still worse. So I will not comment about this equation. I think that there are many. Uh, interesting things to, to, to do to try to understand what, what it means and what you can do. Okay, but, uh, but uh, the very good point is that by, uh, by uh, encoding all this, this, um, this, this uh, cumulants, we have now a reversibility of the dynamics. Okay, and I will stop here because I'm already late. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, it's rather amazing that you can actually carry this out. <laughs> uh, are, there, are there, do people have questions? Uh, I'm not sure do I, uh, Helena, do I? Um, I guess people can ask questions either in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, or they can unmute their microphones. Oh. Um, I can see a question from Arman Tavakoli. Mm -hmm. Can Boltzmann theorems be applied to COVID modeling where each person is a particle? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> well, that would be very relevant. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the first thing, and actually it, it cannot be applied to many other physical systems, even uh, not speaking of, uh, of uh, sociological application. Uh, I think that uh, even for many uh, fluids, it's not uh, applicable because uh, there is this, this uh, low density uh, assumption. And, and actually this, this is really... Uh, uh, an important restriction if you are interested in the full generality of, um, of uh, this kind of systems. There's another question, Walter. Yeah. Um, from Squire. Yeah. From Squire. Okay. Squire asks Are there any known limits to Maxwell's equations? based on particles in flow hitting objects. I'm not sure what that means, flow hitting objects. Um, 
I'm not sure to understand the question, and uh, I'm not I'm sure that I, I don't have the answer to this question. <laughs> uh, yeah, if Squire wants to repeat, okay. Uh, are there any other questions? I'm not sure how I can. I'm looking at the chat. There's a, yeah, the, there are three questions in the Q&A. Uh, where do I, I don't know where to, oh, Q&A, oh, Q&A, okay. Yeah. Okay, does the result mean that the irreversibility only loses on an exponentially long time scale? Um, so of course, uh, once you have, uh, once you take limit, you, you lose something. But this means, I, I think this means that uh, um, in principle, um, uh, there is no reason why, for instance, it, it would not be possible to iterate. So of course, if you look at the, the Boltzmann equation and just a uh, Landford proof, you see that there, there is one major obstruction to iterate uh, the, uh, the process and to get conversions for longer times which is that, say, the structure of the, 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 the distribution at time, say, uh, Landford time, is, is very different from the structure of, of the initial data. The initial data, you assume that essentially it's completely factorized up to a very, very small correction due to the exclusion, okay? And say, at the end of this Landford uh, interval, it's not clear, so you, you know that essentially you still have chaos in a very weak sense, meaning that uh, uh, you have chaos except on, 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 uh, on um, subsets, which are not so big, but which are typically the size of the sets uh, uh, encoding the information for the future. Okay, so actually this, this Boltzmann grand limit is really a very singular limit Meaning that if you uh, look at uh, the, 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 um, the Landford proof, you see that actually all the information which encodes uh, uh, the dynamics, the Boltzmann dynamics on this uh, short time interval is encoded in very, very small sets. Okay, because uh, each time you have a collision, then it means that uh, you are on a really, really small uh, subset of the initial phase space. And so you see that uh, it means that between time zero and time uh, Landford time, you have completely lost the structure of the distribution. Okay. Now what I say is that if you uh, think of this Hamilton Jacobi equation, so somehow it tells you that uh, you still have almost all the information because of course, you know that, say, at f in first approximation, you look like the, the tensor product, but you, you know also the correction for the second marginal, and then you also know the, 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 the correction for the third order correlation function and so on. Okay, so this means that somehow you still have a very, uh, even though it's, uh, the, this information in, is encoded on very small sets, you, 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 you keep it, okay? So, my impression is that, that uh, yes, for, for very long time, so very long time, of course, of the order of, of uh, so comparable to Landford time, so, or maybe very small diffusive time, I think we should uh, be able to, to obtain something which is uh, reversible. And of, so reversibility is one thing, but also uh, the, 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 the fact that you can possibly iterate the process is really important if you would like to have a result for longer times. So I think it opened the door to, to new thing. And actually we have a very, very recent result, uh, uh, say we choose the, the same kind of argument and of method that tells you that actually you can uh, derive the uh, linearized Boltzmann equation and the Stokes equation uh, in any dimension and for a very, uh, very general initial data close to equilibrium. So, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, uh, that we can use this kind of methods also to, uh, to tackle the second problem about uh, time limitation. Thank you. Okay, there are a couple of other questions. One, one, one person asks, do those Hamilton-Jacobi systems, are they integrable? I suppose not. No, I don't think so. Actually, it's a very uh, so I is a functional on the is a functional of of 
h, and h is a function of t and, and z, so it's really a, a mess, okay? It's, um, so i, so the only way we are able to prove that uh, at least we have a solution for short time for this Hamilton-Jacobi equation is to write the two uh, Euler-Lagrange uh, Lagrange equation associated to this uh, uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So one is, is looking like a, ball, a, a forward Boltzmann equation. The other one is looking like a backward Boltzmann equation. And then we are able to, uh, to have a fixed point for uh, say in some kind of analytic setting. So we are really, really far from uh, from understanding this, uh, this, this horrible equation. But uh, if uh, anyone has uh, an idea on how to deal with this, uh, this bad guy, uh, I would be really um, interested in it. Okay, we have two other questions which are related. One, one asks, have you considered elastic or inelastic? I think they're all inelastic. It's a hard sphere, right? Yeah, they are elastic. Yeah. But the next question is, could these results be generalized to non-hard sphere models? So my impression is that as long as you consider um, localized interaction, so an elastic, so of course, uh, of course, if your system is uh, non-elastic, it's irreversible from the beginning. So then uh, there is no question about, uh, so the questions are a little bit different. But if you look at, uh, say a uh, very similar problem where you replace hard sphere by a smooth potential, but with uh, compact support. Then my impression is that uh, uh, of course up to technicalities and, and maybe uh, this is huge te technicalities, I think the same result should hold exactly. Okay, then as long as, as, as soon as you have uh, uh, interaction which are not compact <laughs> support, then it's a, another story. Because because in the Boltzmann equation, what you expect is to have a, a divergence for, um, for creating collisions, meaning that the, the collision cross-section is not uh, integrable, okay? And then, uh, and then say, all, all this, this analysis is really, um, uh, is very rough in the sense that we never use any cancellation between the gain term and the loss term. Probably it's not a good idea, but we don't know how to use this cancellation, except in in all these works on the, the, the linearized equation where we use this constellation just to say that there, there exists uh, uh, an invert measure. Okay, but this is essentially the only way we are able to use this constellation. But in the case where you have uh, this long range interaction, then uh, you see that uh, you have no choice. You, you cannot, so it's even impossible to define solution of the Boltzmann equation without using this constellation. Okay, because say the, the, the singularity in the collision cross section is somehow a console uh, just by looking at the constellation between the gain term and the loss term. So I think that uh, this problem is completely open. So the only, uh, the only result that I know is uh, 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 a result that was obtained by my former PhD, uh, Nathalie Ayi. So she, um, she was able to uh, deal with the case, so, in the, so close to equilibrium. So this is a, linear, a linearized equation. And you assume that, uh, say, uh, the, comp the, the, the interaction is not compactly supported, but you have a double or a triple exponential decay. Okay, so you see that as soon as, as, as say, the interaction are not localized, this is really another uh, level of difficulty. Hmm. Thank you, Laura. Are there, are there any other questions? Well, thank you again for a really fascinating lecture. That was a great introduction. I mean, it's really quite amazing how far you could get. Well, hopefully we can get, go even further, but uh, we, have, we still have to work. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. I guess that's, that's the, um, the end of this, this session, right, uh, Elena? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Lo. Yeah, right. Bye-bye.